Okay, our recording has started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, my name is Sam Scala. I'm the community planning librarian at the Pollard Memorial Library. And I'm here with our lovely two authors, Terry Benton Walker and Adam Sass. And this is gonna be really fun. Um, <laughs> so let's just jump into it. Um, as you can see, I am in my lovely apartment for the night. And if this is gonna be really great, I'm very excited. So <laughs> let's go. Um, start with Terry first. Terry J. Benton Walker is the best-selling author of the young adult contemporary fantasy series, Blood Debts, which is published by Tortine in the US and Canada and Hotterscape in the UK. And we are here today, especially to talk about Alex Wise versus the End of the World, which released uh, just like two days ago, um, two days ago, two weeks ago, yeah. <laughs> um, on September 26th. And that's Terry's apocalyptic middle grade contemporary fantasy series which is published by R Labyrinth Road and uh, Random House Children's. Terry is also editing and contributing to The White Guy Dies First, a young adult horror anthology featuring 13 subversive stories by authors of color that releases in August 2024 from Tortine, which I am very excited for. I cannot wait for that. Yes. <laughs> I've got it in my inbox. It. I'm ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> Terry grew up in rural in rural Georgia and holds a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from Georgia Tech and a master's in business administration from Georgia State. He lives in Atlanta with his husband and son. When he's not writing, he can be found gaming, eating ice cream, or probably both. And next, but certainly not least, we have Adam Sass. Adam Sass began writing books in, on, in Sharpie on the back of Starbucks pastry bags. He's sorry for it distracted him from making your latte. His debut YA novel, Surrender Your Sons, was named Best Book of the Year by Kirkus and Forward Indies, Best First Novel for, for Young Readers by ALA Booklist, won a gold medal for YA fiction at the IPPY Awards, and was a selection for the ALA Rainbow Booklist in 2022. And also, um, our Adults Read YA uh, book club pick for this month, if anyone would like to join us. Hey. I was like, I need an excuse to read it. So yes. I was like, do I use my book club as an excuse to read books on my TBR? Maybe. That I will not confirm or deny. <laughs> no one will be mad. Uh, Adam's newest why I not uh before this one uh was 99 Boyfriends of Micah Summers, was named Best Book of 2022 by 17 Magazine and the Children's Book Council, as well as received rave starred reviews from ALA Booklist and School Library Journal. Adam has been featured in Teen, Teen Vogue, BuzzFeed, and is a frequent guest on the Savage Lovecraft, which is a podcast which I've definitely been meaning to check out. Yeah. Finally, we are here today his, with his newest book, Teen Slasher, Your Lonely Nights Are Over, pitched as Scream meets Clueless, which arrived everywhere September 12th. He lives in Los Angeles with his husband and dachshunds. And... I very much would like to see pictures of your dogs at some point. I don't think I've ever seen them. See, they see. We could have seen them had they behaved out here yeah. five minutes ago, <laughs> but they decided to just cause a ruckus, and so they had to go in the other room. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yes, yeah, so unfortunately, it would have been made a, made an appearance. But yeah, your lonely nights are over. Oh my gosh, uh, we'll be out for tomorrow. We'll be out for one month. Which yeah, is, like a whole month, and it's like which life is wow. a, a, a a Mario Kart game. We, every day is you get a, a new uh, star, and it's just and it's not necessarily mm -hmm. great to be going that fast all the time. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But like sometimes it feels into... like the Rainbow Road. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I'm no, I'm on that one where I'm on that really nasty Mario sixty four like slippery penguin road where you're just like. <laughs> And you uh, fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I feel that on a spiritual level. <laughs> but yeah, um, basically it leads into my first question. How are y'all feeling? It's been almost a month for Adam. It's been almost two weeks for Terry. How are we feeling? Well, Terry, you were um you came out and you you get you did double duty. You were doing my you were doing part a big part of my tour. Uh, cause you came out here and you did my Southern California event. So I feel like you've been on tour essentially for a month as well. Um, 
So it was. It didn't feel like a tour though. It was well, not yeah. for me. It was fun. Um, like it, like that whole weekend felt like a movie. You know, we we oh, both got that. <laughs> it was it was really glorious. It gave everybody depression. It was so good because like then everybody went home and it like the next day, <laughs> a lot of people messaged me and were like, I had to go back to my life afterward. It was that sucked. Like yeah, it was it was it was not good. We had we had a we had a really really good time and a lot of people come out to uh. Both the San Diego event and Mysterious Galaxy and the uh, LA event at the Ripped Bodice. And it just was the, it just, the, the love was huge. And it, it was just really, really, really good times. So at some uh, point, we were, they're going to invent teleporting so that I could be there. I know. <laughs> well, we were just so, you know, so I, speaking of you and me were talking online, uh, Sam, about, because uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be hosting uh, H.E. Edgemont. Oh, God I'm Keaton. so jealous. I it's know. Amazing. Oh my God. Every jealous. I Everybody get jealous. Know. I know. See? See I can't here shut I up about Godly Heathens. I can't shut up about so it. Oh, good. So good. I read it in January. Mm-hmm. I read it in January and, ooh, it's fantastic. I know. I read it in October, last October. I know. Yeah. Uh, no, it was, it was it, <laughs> that book, like, honestly, like, HGH Bond has just given everybody life. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's really, you know, I, I know they've been making books for a while now, but like, it's going to be about time to get, the, to get their letters here. This is going to be really good. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm reading their, um, their middle grade right now. Flicker, and uh, it's, uh, it's a post apocalyptic story, and it is, it's phenomenal. Like it's so good. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, it's it's, it's it's an embarrassment of riches. There's so much good stuff out right now. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so much good stuff out right now, and uh, people barely have brain capacity right now to to uh, to get through anything because every day is um, it's so much a trauma. Yeah, and every day is a, every day is a lot. Every day is overlapping a lot. There's a lot, and then there's another lot you got to do at the end. And then the another day. lot you gotta, falls you gotta, on your head. Another lot, you right? Yep. <laughs> um, so, I, yeah, um, but we're, but the books are good, and the book and the books books are forever. So. The books are great, mm-hmm. especially you your books. It. So oh. for anyone who like is on, only knows one of you, uh, picture books. Uh, the, you guys can decide who goes first. <laughs> Terry, go. Alex Wise versus the end of the world. <laughs> why don't why don't we pitch each other's Oh, that'd be really cool. Pitch each other's books. Okay, so Alex okay. Wise versus the end of the world is um so this is this is a middle grade uh for for, for uh with with the, it's Percy Jackson with a black queer main character. And it is uh, Alex Wise has got the weight of the world on him. Like it's like it's like basically like um, like every queer kid feels like every day is going to be the end of the world. And for Alex Wise, it really is. Um, I feel like it's really kismet that your book came out the same day as the new Percy Jackson came out. But, um, you know, but we're not, we don't got to, we don't got to give all that air time. We don't, we don't give that more air time. It's fine. Um, (laughs) God bless. But like, we're here to talk about Alex Wise. (laughs) Um, I feel like this is, cause this is so, when I read Alex Wise versus the end of the world, because this is, this is going to be a trilogy. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. So this is the first of a trilogy coming out every year. Um, w- whether you're ready to write it or not, uh, it's coming <laughs> out every year. <laughs> and this is going to be one of those things where, um, uh, so Alex Wise has to uh, has to basically face off against the four horsemen of the apocalypse uh, versus instead of uh, demigods and you know and and Zeus and, and and Poseidon and all that he's faced off against the four horsemen. So there's a lot of just uh, really like big apocalyptic stuff he's dealing with, but he's also dealing with his feelings. He is also dealing with um, you know taking care of his sister. He is also dealing with um, his feelings about one of his friends. Uh, that might you know there's a lot more than feelings and um <laughs> and it's just in general crush. like it's beautiful because i think alex wise is a very 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 special protagonist because um because i you know terry i see so much of, of you in him because he's he's young but he's such a serious serious kid um and i don't mean that in the like he's no fun way i mean that in the way where it's like you really feel kind of the tragedy that a lot of um, queer and especially black queer kids go through where it's like they have to take on so much responsibility. They have to take on so much, mm-hmm. um, 
they have to face the world so much earlier, uh, you know, than than a lot of other people do. And um, he has to become, uh, he has to self-parent. He has to parent his, his sister pretty much right away. He has to be responsible for so much and then be responsible for every uh, person on the face of the earth. So, um, <laughs> but it's good zippy fun. Like there's serious stuff, but like, it's also just really like some of these set pieces are gorgeous and you know and i keep wanting to like get ahead of myself and talk about some of the set pieces that you got coming up in the sequel next next september but we'll, no we'll get spoilers. there but... some of us haven't <laughs> no done spoilers it no spoilers but like it's so like you got us you got us like hopping across the nation uh um, mm -hmm. in some of these interesting locations i love that you like you're you're giving me sort of some of my favorite like kind of adventure games from the 90s where it was almost like Carmen San Diego or some of these things were like you pull from history mm -hmm. but then kind of adventurize it and make it so like you're kind of like throwing us into something very interesting but it's not all completely made up it's all some of it's mm -hmm. very 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 grounded in, in 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 real good stuff and so I feel like you're really really mm -hmm. teaching a lot of people with that so I love that yeah, thank you. Kind of like a road um, trip. It kind, it was, kind of sounds like a road trip yeah. after like staying mm -hmm. so central uh, to mm -hmm. uh, to California. So I, I like that. I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit yeah, of a road but... trip. There's a hit in the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do like to like include like little tidbits of, of history and then build upon it. And I do it in all of my stories. There's a little bit of it in my story for the white guy dies first. Um, there's a little bit of it in Blood Debts and Blood Justice and, and all over how it's wide. Um, but yeah, that's a little trick of mine that I like to employ. I, I love that about your work because you're, you're sort of, one of your signature moves is um, a lot of times you are really showing us that there's so much more to the world around us. It's almost like a truth is stranger than f fiction mm -hmm. uh, sort of thing. Like you, the way you view the world. I mean, I think every writer, every creator kind of brings their viewpoint of how they view the world. And I think the way you view the world is there's so much over. I think a lot of people end up seeing the world very like, we know everything. We got everything figured out. Like there's so <laughs> much. And then you have this added benefit of knowledge of just, you know, that we've only barely scratched the surface of how much we all actually know about the world we inhabit. And um, whether that's in your your, your YA de debut, Blood Deaths, which is out right now, um, a, you know, which is, you know, explores a lot of uh, New Orleans and explores a lot of um, race relations within uh, uh, magical family systems in New Orleans. Um, you have these sort of, you use fantasy to sort of access um, parts of our everyday life and, and expand that in ways that might be a little harder to get at, harder to digest even maybe um, in a more straightforward narrative. And uh, I think in Alex Wise, that's no exception. Thank you so much. It's so kind. I love how you get me. <laughs> I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. See how much better I am at pitching your stuff than like- Honestly? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, this is perfect. Like this is the perk of yeah. having like, two authors together and i haven't done like two people together since my very first author talk so this is a lot of fun for me <laughs> terry it's your turn cool Pitch our yes, lovely, enough about me let's talk your about lonely, you the nights are over yes i actually i have a copy right here ah uh, um oh, your yeah, lonely thanks. nights are over is a queer young adult slasher and you got to get the comps right if you do not get the comps right, I am going to fuss at you because that means you do not understand this story. Yes. It is Scream meets Clueless. Yes. Some people like to say Mean Girls, but it is Clueless for those of us who know. And mean Girls is not right. Those. Not, stream, not Scream, <laughs> Clueless, or Mean Girls. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you you're still gonna have a good. You'll still even if you've never seen it, you'll still have a good time. I'm, oh, I'm I have playing, the best I'm time. playing in those sandboxes. You know what? <laughs> uh, anybody, if anybody watching right now has never never seen those, it's all good. It's all good. But yeah, Mean Girls is too. Mean Girls, the titular Mean Girls have a reckoning coming because they are actually kind of doing bad stuff. But uh, Deary and Cole, my main characters. Um, they're closer to 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 share and Dion in in Clueless, right? Yeah, now honey, don't give too much. 
Now I'm gonna let you finish, but this is my question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm setting you back up. I'm lobbing the volleyball over the net at you. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so like in Mean Girls, right? So like Rachel McAdams and like Lindsay Lohan in the in the plastic, like you know, their story was more about like changing like their personalities and like changing who they were and how they interacted with their world, right, with their classmates. But Clueless was more so about like reframing Cher's perspective on the world around her, not so much like changing who she was at her core. And which I feel like Cher and Dion related very closely to Cole and Deary, who are the main characters here on the cover. And so the premise of this story is there is a famous serial killer called Mr. Sandman, who um, a few decades ago went on a killing spree and killed the lonely. And he would always have a calling card. So he sought out like the lonely people in this town. Where where was it? Was it in, um, it was right, it, it was in Arizona. So the, the book takes place in Arizona. The original mm -hmm. killings in the 70s of the original Mr. Sandman were in San Diego. I was gonna say. Yes, San Diego. It was, it was definitely mm -hmm. California. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so when the killer pops back up, in this rural town in San Diego where Darian Cole lives and starts targeting members of their queer club, Darian Cole become the prime suspects. And so as Mr. Sandman starts ripping through the town, and it's a bloody time, I promise you, um, <laughs> Darian Cole set out to like clear their name. And they learn a lot about not just themselves and their friendship, but like how to be better friends to each other and also the other queer people in the community. And it's such, I love this story so much because it's such a very like nuanced and poignant story about friendship. And like, it shines a light on like both the good and the, the negative or more toxic aspects of the queer community. And That's there's my so favorite much in part. here. You, yes, yes. <laughs> there's so much in here that you just do brilliantly. Um, and that's one of them. And another another big thing in here is that you focus on um, mental health care in this story. There is, um, without spoilers, um, you, you dig into like emotional abuse and the effects of that. And you do it with such a deft and skilled hand. And, um, I, and this is not the thing that I, that I love about you and your work is I always feel taken care of when I read something of yours, I always feel safe and at home from the very first page. And even when you're handling like really, really heavy topics, like what you talk about in your lonely nights are over. And um, it's, it's, you just, you do it, you do it very well. And it's, it's a very good read. And, and there's, there's lots here and there's lots to unpack here. So it's one of my favorite stories of yours. Not my favorite, but one of my favorites. You know what, what is your favorite? favorite? Ooh, what is your favorite of each other? Yeah. Let's let's speak on my, it. Yeah, my favorite of yours is it's not out yet. Um, and I'm cheating. I'm skipping ahead a little bit. I was going to talk about this one at the Cheater. end. Um, you were going to. Yeah. So, a book that I am excited about is Cursed Boys and Broken Hearts. It is a companion novel to the 99 Boyfriend of Micah Summer. Oh. And it follows. Yes, it follows Grant Rossi, one of the characters from um, Micah, who dated Micah for a, a time in the book and you get to see a different side of Grant that is just so personal and it's so it's it's like he's just a wonderful character and he's just he's just beautifully angry and just real and like that book transported me back to like a time in my life and I remember when I read it I texted Adam and I was just like thank you for this experience because like he transported me back to a happier time in my childhood and mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of like happy time. So like, I, I'm really thankful when you are able to take me past the bad stuff into the good stuff. Um, that little pocket. But, like, yeah, you took me, you, you, you tucked me into the little pocket of the past, <laughs> uh, into like some really good memory. And I just, and it was so good. And just like the setting, like you also, this is something else you do really well. It's like your setting is almost like a secondary character in the Ooh. story. And just like the setting of like a Vero Rosetto, which is um, the, vi the vineyard, the vineyard that um, the winery and um, bed and breakfast that um, Grant's family runs. And I was like, it's, 
it's a romance, but I was so stressed out about like the fate of Vero Rosetto and the Rose Festival. I was like, we got to get this winery together. Like, <laughs> <laughs> The Rose Festival is coming. <laughs> this was it's very good. It's this was a this was a it's a very person. It's my most personal book. It's um so Grant uh after his breakup, you know, it, it basically deals with his depression by and spends the summer with 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 his aunt uh fixing up Vera Rosetto uh this 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 bed and breakfast that was in his family that you know was a big part of his summers. You know, he's spent the summers there. And, um, you know, and, and he was, he would look forward to it and he would have a, he had a little local best friend, you know, his name is Ben, you know, that he was like, you know, up until he was 13, you know, he, they would, he would look forward to him every summer, you know, and, and there's just a lot of nostalgia going back to that house because he hasn't been back there since he was 13. Uh, Cause a few bad things really, a few really bad things happened that made him kind of stop going there. His grandmother passed away and, and the family stopped really go in there after she passed and uh and he had a huge fight with Ben because he was kind of in love with Ben and then there was a big blowout between them and he hasn't seen anybody again so he comes back you know and it was you know and Vera Rosetta was one of those things which is it's this house where I pulled a lot from my own life um because my own uh grandmother passed when I was 16 um and well, I had a, so this was a, a house that, that my family had. It wasn't a vineyard bed and breakfast. It was just a place, you know, it was just a house. Um, but um, I made sure, you know, this was, this was something where, you know, my grandmother passed and we really, we really basically stopped going after this. And, um, you know, there was this, there was this threat of losing the house and that threat kind of comes into the, into the book. And, um, uh, you know, in real life, um, I never saw that house again. Uh, but this book allowed me to put down all my memories of the house. So inside the house, every descriptor is exactly the way it was. So Aww. all my nieces and my, my, my littler cousins who were too young to, to go there, you know, or just, you know, everybody else, like there's just, there's a, there's a record of it. Um, of like this this place and that this book felt like a second chance for me to um, give Grant the, uh, the opportunity that I never had, which is to maybe he can save his house. Maybe he can save the house this time. Um, and so he, but they've got to fix it up for this Rose Festival. And, um, you know, they don't got a lot of money. The money's really running out. The place is in shambles. Um, and his aunt is like, oh, well, you know, can you just please help me out? All you got to do is work with um, this local gardener I hired and, <laughs> and we'll be good. And so Grant's like, all right, fine. I'll work with this gardener. And he, and he meets the gardener and it turns out it's his childhood friend, Ben, all grown up oh, and looking yeah. very hot. And they have the biggest, <laughs> just nastiest summer hate fest. <laughs> Enemies to lovers is too soft of a word uh, for the, what the two of them have. Uh, and they basically have to kind of work together, work through their stuff to uh put this house together and you know and then there's and there's a whole bunch of so in, in, in like it like it's from the world of micah micah was uh, a cinderella remix from the prince's point of view and this book curse boys and broken hearts is beauty and the beast from the beast's point of view so we got Ooh. sort of a there's a line earlier on in, in the book where this is kind of a a beast meets beast love story because bells are out this year um and so you got two nasty like there's not like that's it's, it's it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit different than the Beauty and the Beast stories because like they're both just yelling at each other the whole time <laughs> they're they're both just like starve then um, like, so it's just how is this gonna work so Terry I'm so glad you had a good time with that but yeah it just I, I I pumped a whole bunch of um, nostalgia into that because I knew even though it's so specific to my family, I think it seemed like you and, and, and hopefully probably a lot of others like you, like, you know, we all have a Vera Rosetto in our past that mm -hmm. was like, there was something in our past where there was a place where even if the rest of our life was sort of scary and unpredictable and we couldn't really be brave, that there was some place where we felt safe that we mm -hmm. miss very much. And yeah. uh, that's what this place is. Yeah. yeah. I don't usually it, it, read rom-coms, but I, I'm convinced I will be reading this. 
I don't usually yeah. rom com like at all, but I, I, so I've been sold. I, I don't either. But Adams are amazing. Like I like I typically don't pick up rom coms, but his are very good. And also, like I want I want to set the record straight. So, Curse Boys is my favorite, but that's not to say that Your Lonely Nights Are Over is not the one that I cherish the most because this is also the one that like you partially dedicated to me. So this book will always be special to me. But so like I blame you because this is what you do. Like with every single project. <laughs> Like every project you work on becomes my new favorite. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> because you keep challenging yourself and you keep getting better and better with everyone. And I think like the next <laughs> one that you come out with after Curse Boys, then that one's gonna become my favorite. But um, See, so yeah, that's I, that's the benefit of your best friend being like one of your favorite authors too. <laughs> this is you. You are making me blush. You're making me blush, but you're also giving me like the the, the little the demon voice in my head is going like one of these days. Terry's gonna read one and he's not gonna be like, this is my new favorite. And then it's get you're gonna be, you're gonna be like, I messed up. I messed up on this one. <laughs> oh my God. Well, the good thing about it is, you know me and you know, I always tell you the truth. <laughs> That's what you need in That's a best you friend. Will. You need a best friend who will tell you how it is. That is the thing. Like, I feel like very, very blessed in that way because I've got, you know, Terry, you, and my agent both are like, both of you were like, I will lay down for Adam Tess. However, I will be the first person to just <laughs> cut, this shit, cut this into ribbons. I will, no, wrong, <laughs> incorrect. <laughs> oh my gosh. But the, the, what I can say is the good thing about you is you're always like objective and open to like receiving like different viewpoints, which I think is what makes you such an exemplary artist. So not everybody Thank you. I, 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 I feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's my natural pleaser state. I'm very much just like, it sounds good. I know, love it. Um, whatever you say, like, no, it, but it, I think it's one of those things where I, I come from a, I come from a screenwriting background. I come from like a, a, a screenwriting sort of writer's room background where like it just everything was collaborative and um it, you could you it, it was an environment where you could still have a very strong writer's identity while receiving 200 notes that you had to implement you had no choice but to not implement mm -hmm. so i think and then it was like about finding ways to get your voice in there through there while also and i think for a lot of people that can be a big challenge it, it is a challenge um, to still feel like you have ownership over that story or that you said things the way you wanted to while you're making like just dozens upon dozens of compromises. Um, and uh, I feel like that's part of, you know, that's why, you know, I always applaud people who uh, achieve authorial success at like 21 or whatever. Uh, but I do think um, achieving it much later in life, as, as you and I have done, uh, allowed us a special window into the craft that only comes from being like, well, you had to have three or four different career paths um, to learn different skill sets and then, and then bring those to writer. Because the cool thing about being a writer is that like your resume could be ed anything and everything. You could have six, 17 different jobs on that resume. And at any other job, they take a look at that resume and they'd see, this is all over the place. What is this? But with the writer's resume, it only adds to it because yeah, you benefit. know, you can add, you know, you know, if, if you're a bookseller or a librarian, like, you know, you can bring, I, I know exactly how, what's selling in this area. I know exactly what's sort of moving right now. I know exactly sort of on the ground things. If you're like like me, like I used to be a barista for like eight years. A lot of that went into 99 Boyfriends of Mike Summers. You know, I could bring that into, you know, so like anything where you could bring your own perspective and things, you know, you did a ton of project management, Terry. Like that, that's that's why you're able to do like two fantasy series at, at once. once. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they're still wild. drastically different. Wild. <laughs> yeah. wild. Wild. It's crazy. Very wild. <laughs> right. Absolutely crazy. Anybody but, else would have just been like hung up a shingle and been like, uh, the book is delayed. <laughs> the book is delayed. I'm so sorry. You're gonna have to wait. 
Because Terry, you were writing <laughs> basically Blood Justice and then right to Alex Wise. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I couldn't switch like that. My ADHD doesn't work. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I couldn't um, do that. I mean this in the best possible way. Stressful time to be your friend was in that corridor <laughs> of time when you were it writing was. Blood Justice. <laughs> releasing blood debts writing alex wise 2 was like all at once you a locomotive mm -hmm. like I, would, I i could see you were doing great but it was like i could see that i was like oh you're it's like when you're watching like a gymnast do the balance where you're like huh, 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 huh. like I would, it's a lot of yours like you just can, can't help but put yourself in like how could i do that you just see the 15 different ways mm -hmm. you can just eat it on the mat. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but no, no, you're absolutely right. Like my past uh consulting career does help me to like um prioritize and manage my workload now. Because in consulting you have to learn how to work fast and efficiently if you wanted to sleep. <laughs> so and so now I'm able, that translates to publishing. So I just organize and manage my time. And that also helped with anthology too, like being um, project manager from hell. <laughs> I was going to say, and your project managing 13 story anthology. And you got a, and you got a three-year-old and you got a little one. Yeah. And a whole child, a whole child. <laughs> and you get sad because you don't have a dog sometimes. Like, no, oh, not no. yet. <laughs> not yet. We're in awe. I but do. Yeah, the, you, yeah, I do. I do miss, I do miss having a pet. I want a dog. But mm. Adam, what's your favorite of Terry's? Oh my gosh. Um. So I'm I'm not completely done with it yet, but by far, it is Blood Justice, the sequel to Blood Deaths. Um, Blood Justice is, and this is no, this is no offense to Blood Deaths, which is a fabulous book. <laughs> um, but it is Blood Deaths is a prologue to Blood Justice. Ooh. Um, and I mean that in the best possible way. It, uh, uh, Blood Justice feels like the story you're really you really set out to tell. You know, Blood Deaths is a great, great story. But when you get to Blood Justice, you're like, oh, this is, this was, you were building the mouse trap contraption the whole time mm -hmm. to get to this. And this is where it all starts to kind of go. Like the, the book one was you setting up everybody and really laying a lot of scenes. It's a very, it's almost like this is a, fa it's like the most fascinating prequel. It's almost like a blood, it's almost like Blood <laughs> Justice is the book one and then you did like a Suzanne Collins later on and Blood Debts was your like Songbird and Snakes prequel. Mm -hmm. um, like it's, it's, it's setting up this world. Um, it's a, 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 a Blood Justice is um, needy. It's like, she did. It's, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I think you had to get like told that it's like, listen, the binding, we got to use on this. You got to cut it back a little bit. Yeah, like, I think it was like something. We, like you were, we were worried that the word count was too much. Wait, how <laughs> long is it? To, we're getting close to like changing the price point, I think. Yeah, so it was like to yeah. keep it at like a good price point. Yeah. Uh, it's Terry, like, it's how like, long it's, is it? It's, so the very first draft of, of it was 160,000 words. And so the final is like 150 or like just under 150,000. Oh my so God. It's it's funny because like we were exchanging, I was giving you Cursed Boys and Broken Hearts at the same time mm -hmm. you were giving me Blood Justice. And like, you just like zoomed through Blood, you, you <laughs> zoomed through Cursed Boys. And I was like, and I was like, oh my God, you read my book so fast. And like Cursed Boys, the first pass is like 50,000. And you were like, well, to be fair, Blood Justice is like three of your books in one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like three. It was like more than that. And it was so, and you were doing it like, because you're doing so many POVs. There's layered. It, it's truly mm -hmm. Game of Thrones in, in how many it really is. points of view. Like characters from book one were getting full points of view chapters on now. And the world is just expanding. It's almost like you... Um, yeah, it's 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 almost like you're going from like a, a Nintendo sixty four Zelda game to a Switch Zelda game, 
where there's just <laughs> the world I is just huge. Like I love the Nintendo mm-hmm. 64 Zelda games, but like the world just exploded and opened up in mm-hmm. this like way that's almost overwhelming. Um, Blood Justice and you know that the, all, you know the length aside because you know, I, I keep being like the length the girth I, I'm, I'm talking about that <laughs> but like um but to the content it is daring um it's one of those things where I I and I'm not going to give too much away here um or anything away but like <laughs> it's almost like so Terry got a lot of I don't know how much you want to say a lot but like Terry you got um you know, comments, a little nasty, you know, kind of good reads and things on blood mm-hmm. debts, you know, and just in general, sort of people sort of nasty little sort of stuff about, you know, woke stuff in books. And when you sat down to write Blood Justice, it's almost as if you just said, okay, well, now you're really going to get it. And just you hit the gas and just went completely, <laughs> you just ran into their house. Mm-hmm. And just like ran through their house <laughs> with the car, so, like it's like it's gonna be it's like it's almost just like oh you're gonna be bothered by this. Well, <laughs> what if I just ran through your house with my car? It's mm-hmm. like it is the content of this is it's so daring in the in the best way possible. Um, you you really get into themes of um like when violence is appropriate and, you know, and about oppressor versus a, a, the oppressed and uh, don't want to get into that right now, but like <laughs> um, if we're going to, uh, it, it, it engages with it in a very serious, nuanced, grown up, refreshing, cool, honest way that is just pumping with honesty. Even if you don't agree with it, it's like, hugely honest it is hugely full-throated uh just brave work and it reading it every time i read it it makes me want to go further push myself further because i keep doing things where i'm like okay well i'm going to do a little bit of this we're going to talk a little bit about this we're going to talk a little bit about that but it's making me want to on on a future book of mine hit the gas in such a way Mm -hmm. Uh, it's I'm <laughs> so into it. I, I I I'm so sorry. I've had to speak so mysteriously because yeah. I don't want to ruin sorry. anything. Because it's it's, it's <laughs> that's the, the perks the nitri- of reading early. When the, when the nitrous hits on this book, like you're mm-hmm. you don't want to have anything spoiled. Like everything just goes mm-hmm. goes goes, and there you go. And that's what I'll say. Blood justice is going <laughs> to be the one, and I'm not even done with the thing yet. So it's yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're like, sorry, I'm not done yet. I'm only on page 200. <laughs> it's like a 500 page word. Document. I'm only on page 200. Oh I'm only at tw- I'm only at 30 percent. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait till you're done. Then, if you're only like halfway, not even. No, it's and so, but I, but I, but I will say, but I do, I do know kind of where it's going because, like, obviously, Terry and I have had a lot of conversations. I've read a lot of the outlines, so I kind of oh, I know he's where read the whole outline and synopsis. And- so I, I know where I know where it's all headed. We know where it's going. We know where it's going. And I see Dustin Turner asking in the comments here: Is Blood Death going to be a trilogy? Uh, I know that's an unclear. That's a, the the Magic Eight Ball says too soon to tell on that. I think, but yeah, yeah. Um, so we're actually having conversations about that now. So the jury's still out. Hopefully, it will be a trilogy. Um, ideally, it will be more than that. But we'll see. Yeah. Um, the answer is I don't know right now. Please let it be at more a minimum. Write all the books at a minimum <laughs> three. But just when you read Blood Justice, you're going to see what I mean. Where you're just like, you could just keep. Mm-hmm. There's so there. It would be a shame to stop at three because there's so. We haven't even begun to turn over all the rocks. Uh, I was going to say there's so much so, in that world. There's so much, right? Oh, did we lose Terry? We we might have blipped him. Terry returned from war. I upset Terry by bringing up the the trilogy a sensitive topic. <laughs> <laughs> Terry's returned from war. 
<laughs> As, I had, I had to go take a breather. <laughs> <laughs> this is <Why>? <laughs> I'm just happy it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Dustin. So it's um, no, it, we we joke about it all the time. I bring it up every day. I'm always just like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> So I think the next thing I really want to talk about is, so you've both worked with different publishers and are published by different publishers. And I'm wondering if you guys could share a little bit about how the process is, like the stark differences, like between the publishers you've worked with. Um, something I'm particularly interested in is like, uh, I think like most people who are in bookish spaces know that um, authors have like varying levels of uh, control over their covers so I'm really interested in how much like control you guys had over that depending on your different books uh, I mean it's been my experience that I haven't been like here's your cover enjoy like I've never had that um there's always been a push like there's always it's always been a push pull because I will say because I've had four covers my fourth cover reveal comes out Curse Boys cover reveal next Wednesday. Ooh. Um, head to my pages next Wednesday. Um, it, it's great. I think like I, I have four wonderful covers. I think the the, the issue kind of becomes every, there's a lot of different perspectives that have to be considered because it's not just what the author would like. Um, it's uh, it's um, See, I brought up the sensitive topic of covers. And Jerry was like, I'm out of here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I can get it kicked down. <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, it's so like, long story short, like there's like, they bring sales departments in. So like, you know, there's different, there's different things that, um, you know, that'll, you know, like sales and, you know, school and library has a department. And um, there's all these different departments that have, you know, publicity, social media, like every every aspect of the book publishing experience has like a department. And then there's like the illustrator, then there's the designer, what they would like. There's their own personal stamp. There's the illustrator, their own personal style. And then there's you, the author, you are included, but you're not the only person. Um, they'll usually ask me, you know, I think Terry, you kind of had the same thing. They'll ask you sort of for like, you know, aesthetics or, you know, um, collages, that sort of thing, and sort of mood boards. Um, mm -hmm. And you kind of just say like, I'm feeling, you know, this. Um, and, uh, and it's always a fun part of the process. And I've kind of learned over time to stick to like one mood board on that. Cause like, they'll like, <laughs> they they do kind of be like, we, like, we do gotta put out 50 or 60 of these so um it, there's it's a push and pull it like it, it's you go through like six or seven different versions and you kind of tweak it and they will listen to you if you kind of have you have to kind of do your reason you have to be like i would like this because this character is closer to this in the book like there was um in the 99 boyfriends care you know uh, uh cover one of the characters elliot um is is bigger bodied and then it, it, like it just the, the the illustrator doesn't really read the book ahead of time they just kind of know mm -hmm. like oh here's the basic stats of this character and kept getting he kept getting drawn as a twain and i was like stop no no, no. Don't do that. Like, stop. <laughs> so you kind of have to have these moments where there's like real reasons to stop you know real reasons to kind of turn around like it needs to match the character that's sort of in the book and in a you know in a, in a in an important especially for something that's important like you know if this character is you know is this character is bigger bodied or if this character is you know um lighter skinned or darker skinned like you know like th there's these things where it's like you're representing like a certain kind of uh you know you know reader and the last thing you want to do is like describe something in the book and then like they're getting they're getting all excited reading that description and then they see on the cover and it's like not really matching. I think that's yeah, you want to avoid is. that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but other other than that, like, I just been I've been lucky that they've really kind of nailed the vibe of that. Terry, but what about yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me, um, 
I do, for every book, I create a cover brief and I get super detailed. And this is like the project manager side of me. And like every character has like their own page. And I find like um, real life actors and actresses that like look like the character. Um, I, I figure out like the Pantone, like skin tone color. And like I've specified that on the slide. Um, and then I do mood boards and everything. And like they do, they ask me, like they take my opinion into account and they ask me um, like what I want to see on the cover, like for the cover of Blood Justice, um, I got to tell them I wanted the um, the blood moon on the cover because that's something that's um, specific to the story of Blood Justice, um, as well as the key and the flowers that are like interwoven in the background are snapdragons, which are also important to the story. Um, so like I got to give little details about that and, and like the designer and the artist went out and came up with something like absolutely incredible. And then like I get to, so we get to see sketches and I get to give feedback and like suggest tweets and some of them happen, some don't. Um, but like, as you were saying earlier, you know, like we have to go with like what the artist is capable of doing in the timeline and we have to listen to sales and school and library and yeah I wanted to get sometimes violence is the answer as the tagline on the cover for blood justice but school and library were like absolutely not. <laughs> wait what did you want to add sometimes violence is the answer oh my god <laughs> listen <laughs> it's one of the things uh, in the book <laughs> it is it is and it is and you know, they're just gonna have to get that. They're just gonna have to get that uh, by by cracking open the book and reading it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but it, yeah. it's still there. <laughs> yeah, just not on the cover. <laughs> just uh, that's that, that's right. Um, yeah, I mean, and Terry, your covers are so gorgeous. I mean, it, it's it's I I like the 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 pan the, the skin swatches the Pantone colors really helped me when I saw you do that because like then like if, if it's not quite correct you get to do the thing that you love doing I don't know you don't love doing it but it's like you do the little like extend the little pointer and you go here this is no it is this it is this color <laughs> do it again yeah like Miranda Priestley coming in yeah <laughs> yeah I have found that it does help to like eliminate some of the vagueness of descriptions because like it could be very objective when people are like designing characters right because it's, it's still a little bit even though you can have a description it's still kind of nebulous but like if I give you a, a person who looks similar to that with like the hair and the pantone like it's very very clear very clear <laughs> like, what, what you I need want. to do yeah <laughs> and you're not very picky like you just want it to be in the neighborhood mm -hmm. of that and you yeah. know it's just one of those things like They've got a lot of. I think. I think that's the other thing. You. You know, Sam. Your original question was about like different publishers. I think mm -hmm. Terry and I are both at larger publishers yeah. right now. I started at a small publisher for Surrender Your Sons Flux, mm -hmm. and um, there are benefits, you know, pluses and minuses of both. Um, but at a larger publisher, you got to realize of just the YA, you're like one of like a hundred books. So many, right and so, so many. many, and like when you're putting these notes in and like maybe a sketch comes back and they didn't implement every note, like this designer and this, everybody is like, they are like doing this, 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 that for like a hundred different people. And like, sometimes mm -hmm. there's going to be, it's everything to you. This is one of a hundred to mm -hmm. them. So like, you kind of have mm -hmm. to shift your, as much as Terry and I want to be like, <laughs> yeah to shift your expectations like <laughs> you do you just have to cut again it's, it's it's sort of the name of the game about everything i think right now in life is just like you have to understand everybody's underwater yeah <laughs> everybody's a citizen of uh uh namor's underwater kingdom um and, and that's it <laughs> so I want to go to see if we have a Q&A, but I'm going to jump to at least one book specific question um, before we do that. Um, so Terry, you've written for different audiences, middle grade and YA, while Adam, you've written wildly different genres with rom-coms and thrillers. Um, 
what are those processes like for you? So, so Terry, what's it like uh, writing for the different audiences? Adam, how do you manage to write such wildly different genres? <laughs> I'm honestly very amazed. Uh, <laughs> Whoever wants to go for first. Me, yeah, I'll go first. You go. Uh, for me, when it comes to writing for different audiences, um, like I, I, I like YA and middle grade for different reasons, right? So like with YA, um, I love just like how real I can be with the teen experience and just like show like the struggle of trying to become or being a young adult and like trying to carve out like your space in the world and like all the strife and angst and everything else that comes along with that. Um, and it's like a really important time in your life. And it, it's, um, I, I, I like that I can talk about more of the like serious themes in young adult. But then also I love middle grade, but it's like I get to be silly mm-hmm. in a way that I don't get to be in young adult um, while still um, being able to talk about like serious topics. Um, and so I think for me, like the process is the same when it comes to just like doing the, like building the concept and planning and writing. Um, but for me, where the change comes into play, it's just like managing um being aware of the audience that I'm writing for and the young adult audience versus like the middle grade audience, which for me means like in middle grade, like I can't curse yeah. and I have to like be careful how scary I write things. <laughs> Even though like there are some parts of Alice Wise that are like pretty scary. So. Oh yeah. Like uh, one of the questions <laughs> that I'm definitely not going to get to, but you're, you <laughs> both of your books have like spooky vibes. Like Adam, obviously it's a thriller. It, spooky vibes are in the thriller but (laughs) what I really like about Alex Wise is that it gets us some really spooky things and kind of like the whole apocalypse is pretty damn spooky Mm -hmm. yeah and the apocalypse and especially Shadow Man Shadow Man's pretty creepy (laughs) it feels to me when I'm like it feels to me like one of those like 80s Disney movies when they did like dark fantasy movies where it was like Mm -hmm oh my God, for kids? But it's like, it was such a big part of my identity that I was like, yes, this movie, I will still, I will watch it every decade of my life. Um, That's kind of, I feel like that's the kind of work you do in middle grade where it's mm-hmm. just like, you, I don't know, you write for like the really cool younger kids. Too, so. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> um. Oh, my, uh, so my, 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 my genre jumping. Yeah, your um, wild genre jumping, which is really Yeah, no, I mean, it's, my, this is um, a wild skill, by the way, to have. Not everybody can do that. Thank you. I um uh yeah. My goal is to get the full Thanos glove of um genres, <laughs> and so like I gotta get fantasy. I gotta do mm-hmm. sci-fi. Um, I did horror. I got you know, genre. I got contemporary. I got rom com. So you know, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. But no, I think I think for me, um, it it just like I, I didn't like set out to be like I'm gonna do I'm gonna show everybody what I'm gonna do I'm gonna show my range. Um, it kind of like ended up that way, and I kind of just rose to that challenge. I kind of just every time I set out to do a new book, I just go, what do I basically feel like writing next? And I did this just ultra dark, um, uh, you know, a book with uh, Surrender Your Sons, which is about. Uh, it's a thrilling book about it, you know, it's a big, big, hopeful, you know, victorious book about escaping conversion therapy, but dances with a lot of dark topics. And so I knew coming out of that and then it was like lockdown. That's when I was like, it was just so heavy and I was putting out this heavy book and it was a heavy time and I was going through something heavy that I really was just like, I wanted to access sort of a sweeter part. I mean, that's what kind of led me to a rom-com with 99 boyfriends and, um, as far as the craft of that goes, and then I was doing Your Lonely Nights Are Over, which I was actually writing before I was writing 99 Boyfriends. I just needed oh. more time to develop it. I mean, I was writing Lonely Nights Are Over when I was still trying to sell Surrender Your Sons. That was the book that I was writing. Just whenever you're like trying to sell a book, um, you should really have another book that you're writing just to like distract you um, because it's the only... I'm on sub with another book right now. And my agent was like, time to write another one. Like, it, like you just, like, there's the, it's the only way to stop yourself from 
losing it is you just have to do the next thing because you have to kind of convince yourself that there is a next thing. Um, so that was sort of my distraction book. And then I needed time to really build that out because I, I, I basically write through improvisation. So a lot of it, you're, you're no one's ever really reading my first drafts. Um, uh, because so much of it is just here, 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 and here, and then it takes a while to kind of get back in. Mm -hmm. um, and so through that, the, like sort of the craft way I do these things is I don't really see them as different worlds. Um, there was a line in Curse Boys, which is back to to rom coms, that I had to that I had to cut because my editor. So I had the same editor for Nine and Nine Boyfriends, Curse Boys, and Your Lonely Nights Are mm -hmm. Over. And um, where I was going to acknowledge the Mr. Sandman killings in Curse Boys. That would have been Grant, really cool. Because Grant is like so lonely and like he's had a summer of just being so lonely. And like in the very first chapter, we're sort of seeing him in his sort of den of depression because he's graduated high school and he's just in his studio apartment. And he's supposed to be applying for college and he's just blown every deadline. And he's just in a self-destructive spiral. And then like, he's basically like, not even near where the Lonely Nights killings took place, but like just mm -hmm. it was on the news, so he was just like, "It's like me, I'm next." So he like like the whole summer like, slept with like a dresser in front of his door, Aww. and I thought it was like such a sweet little funny little moment to kind of connect the world. Mm -hmm. And my editor was just like, "What if people have never read that? You're just like opening talking about a serial killer, mm -hmm. like this rom com, and like it was kind of, like it's," and I was like. Yes, but like mm -hmm. everybody reading this should be like a big Adam Sass dork. So like yeah, they should absolutely. this should be like we're past we're past that point of like new people. Yeah. But like um if, and if she was I like don't edit editor, I would have let you keep it. <laughs> yes, right. Thank you. <laughs> well uh, well, but so just imagine that scene happen. Um because I'm always wanting to put together the sleuth that's literary universe. Um so I had all of these characters, um that were crossing over. And I, I think that's kind of how, for me, it was, um, all the characters seem to be like kind of coming from the same place. They occupy the same world. They have the same sense of humor about things. They're just um, dealing with uh, different given circumstances. Um, Cause I have the same style, like the, the voice of Grant, uh, the, the cursed boys, of uh, and lonely nights um it's the same voice we're just dealing with um a, a much more heightened atmosphere and heightened things because i mean tara you just you said it um the are they going to lose the house was just as suspenseful mm -hmm. as is someone or is someone mm -hmm. going to get killed so yeah, you know honey you it, you keep me stressed like no I mean, matter that's what kind like, of the best kind of horror, <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're reading a, a whether you're reading a romance or you know a thriller i'm like you know you're i'm keeping you stressed there's cliffhangers we're, we're kind of dealing with the same kind of like building blocks i'm kind of dealing with and uh yeah that was that was kind of the thing and i oh gosh i really i r.i.p that line but yeah that, that would have been so I, cool i think it, yeah it was uh, yeah it well just maybe we'll do maybe i'll do a little director's cut version later on we'll re i'll re-release it i'll do one of those money grab things where i'm like it's a new cover it's a new one you need to have the whole set right um and this one has an expanded line so if you like it buy it in every color <laughs> i do that with my book he has a new hat yeah <laughs> uh, i guess if we have a cut if you guys have some time do we want to do a quick q a so does anyone have any quick questions yeah sure Going once. I'll give him Ooh. Grumpy Monkey. Love the Grumpy Monkey. Thank you, Raven. <laughs> I guess I have a quick. Oh, we have Q. There's a whole Q and A section. I have a brain cell. <laughs> uh, Cassie uh, asks, "What characters from your books would be friends with each other?" Ray, I think Instagram about this the other day. 
I think, um, like from our own books or from each other's books, we could do both. I think Cole each other's books. Clem, Why not? Yeah, I think Cole and Clem would be friends. They would. It would be so like they would end up. They would mess around at first because like they're like that, and so it's like something would happen. Um, they might fall out yeah, and be right. like cat right. for a second, and then like they would come back and they'd realize they're better as friends. <laughs> <laughs> They would be, be so like, messy together. Cole would be like, mm-hmm. like Cole would catch on very quick that like being in Clem's orbit gets you dead. And so you, he'd just be like, uh, I will come back at a later time. Yes. <laughs> I would be so messy. <laughs> yeah, and I think um in my books, I think Clem and Alex would be have more of like a brother mentorship relationship. Yes. Um, yeah, like Alex would just be totally enamored by Clem and would just like follow him around like a lost puppy, and Clem would protect him with his dying breath. And Alex would also pick up some of Clem's like more unsavory habits, like cursing. <laughs> I need, I need, I need that drawn. Just uh, Alex following Clem like a lost puppy now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think um I think from my between between our books, I would say I think Hannah from 99 Boyfriends um would be good friends with Chris from Blood Debts. Mm-hmm. Um so Hannah, because Hannah is like she is 17 going on 35, just like Chris. Mm-hmm. And they they're career women. And they kind of have a life plan, and they are responsible, and they have got things, you know. And they, and I, and I, that's, that's a, a big part of why I love cool so much is because, like, she's got because I don't have a lot of characters who are very like, and then the life plan is this way. Um, mm-hmm. But Hannah is that way. Hannah is very um, in ninety nine boyfriends. She's uh, Micah's best friend, and she's got um, when Micah goes over to uh, to her house there's um a big uh uh chalkboard in the back as her parents are chefs that run this very bougie uh very bougie uh restaurant and uh they they run things like so tight over there they are like they're like an empire family like they are like <laughs> everything is in 15 minutes they're like socializing 15 minutes exercising 30 minutes like everything is done and like there's a point at which um because she tries to have like she tries to she gets a boyfriend that she kind of likes and she she has to sneak off and see him because we find out and uh jackson is his name that he's kind of like a grungy little miscreant who doesn't run on a clock and is is kind of you know letting her you know you know disrupting her very rigid ways and uh and uh she has to like kind of erase the board and kind of mess with the board to kind of keep him in uh her life and so i think she's very rigid in structure and i I think she's far more rigid than chris is but i think they'd be really good friends because i think chris would like understand her i think everybody else in in hannah's life sees her as like you gotta relax but i think chris would at least understand her but chris has a much chris is able to modulate and is able to Mm -hmm. kind of you know, she's not she's not under someone else's, you know, thumb in that mm-hmm. kind of way. So I think she'd be able to really kind of help out a little sister like that uh, and uh, kind of think, keep things running. And I think also, like, Chris would appreciate the fact that, like, Hannah has it together because, like, Chris is so sick of, like, Valentina's and Sophia's, like, high school catty girl BS. Uh-huh. And so she just wants to, she just wants to like, be around someone who's, like, mature and has their stuff together and is not, like, with all drama. So she would appreciate that. I feel like there's two types of, like, there's, like, the gay guy <laughs> who just wants a cool gay guy to hang out with who does not enrage them. And then that same way for, like, a, a teenage girl who's like, I yes. just want to hang out with the girl who's not gonna just make me nuts, and <laughs> I that, that's definitely def, definitely Chris because like I feel like she doesn't have any like because she's got she doesn't have any good friends. I think she's got I think she's got Clem, mm-hmm. but he is yeah he 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 has a lot going on. <laughs> he he's a little preoccupied, just a little. Um, so actually, there's two questions because they're both really good but i'm gonna ask a more serious one first and then i'm gonna jump to one that should be done really fast 
Um, but uh, Caitlin says, happy coming out day. Uh, as queer authors, what do you think about the impact that you have on young people who read your books? When I was growing up, unfortunately, there wasn't as much diverse representation in YA in middle grade. I'm so happy authors such as you two are writing for young people now. Um, I would say, very good question. Um, happy coming out day. I didn't even realize everyone. that it was coming out day until like late today. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. I should have known that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's okay, life been life in. Um, <laughs> but, right. But I will say um, it means a lot to me to be able to put um, these stories out now featuring Black queer characters because, like Caitlin, I didn't have sto stories where I could see myself reflected um, growing up. And if I had had stories like Alex Wise and Blood Death and characters like Alex and Clem, like the, the trajectory of my young adult life would have been completely different from where it was. And it would not have taken me 38 years to learn to love my authentic self. And so by telling these stories, I hope that it does not take another Black queer boy or any queer person, period, who can hopefully see themselves in these characters. It will not take them that long to love themselves. Like, uh, happy National Coming Out Day. Um, and My feelings on this are because again, I think I think as we get a few years into the ball, uh, like the, I, I, it's 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 making every it's making it true because what they're doing is they're attacking our ability to communicate these ideas. In fact, I think that I can't. There was something. Um, there was something said. I think it was in sort of the the language of this like Florida brief about it, which was saying that they were because they were banning all. Mm -hmm. LGBTQ content at all. If there was a character, if there was anything at all, it was getting banned uh, throughout all grades. And there was a previous iteration where they said, um, okay, um, ban it, you know, only ban it if it has like uh, sexual content or it is teaching uh, young people how to be an LGBTQ person. And I read that and the the Kill Bill alarm in my eyes went off because I was like, that is what it is. Because what they are trying to do is cut off the information to just how to be a person. It's not, here's who you are. It's not any of that because mm -hmm. a lot of people out or not know who they are. A lot of it is showing different ways to be a queer person so because a lot of people a lot of the distress people get young queer people get before they come out and maybe a little bit after that is they fear like um i have to be a different person i can't be me and th then be this like queer person whatever they feel like that person is and my goal with my books is that's why all my books are so different you got surrender your sons which is like mm -hmm. you got these really religious country kids for all you know you know just, just just up to no good and then you've got 99 boyfriends where you've got these sort of you know a little more you know sort of been out for a long time sort of more privileged city kids uh you know and but they're sort of more more sheltered and then you've got lonely nights where they've been out just as long but they're they're kind of a blend of the two they've been out for a while but they're kind of rough around the edges and they're still telling people like it is and they're, and part of the conflict in Lonely Nights is that they are not um, joiners. They don't, they, they would like to do things the way they'd like to do things and they don't take kindly to being cajoled by the larger queer club in the school about how to do things. And my goal, why I'm doing so many different viewpoints is to show queer kids that like, is this you? Is this you? Is this you? Is this you? And I think because it could be anybody, um, you could recognize your friend. You, I had somebody who said, who told me she read Surrender Your Sons and said, I finally recognized my brother after decades. You know, I recognized, you know, why he was angry. Why was he so angry? People couldn't understand. And it was like, it helps people kind of put things into context. It makes sense of the world. It removes the fog 
that the, 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 that these religious right people are, are putting on it. They want the fog there. Mm -hmm. They want you not to know how to be a queer person. It's not about mm -hmm. anything else than that. They want you to not know how to be it because you, they, because then you are just inside the whole time. So mm -hmm. the answer to your question is, um, what well, would have showed me had I had access to that because this character, Deary, is closest to me. Uh, it would have showed me because again, I, when I came out, I was so um, like, I had like, I gotta get a boyfriend. I had such a boyfriend on the brain. I was like, if I'm gay, if I'm going through all this, I gotta get a boyfriend. I wish I'd just slowed it down. And this mm -hmm. book is all about, you don't need a boyfriend. Right? You don't even need a boyfriend at all if you don't. Um, and I can, sh I show with this, you can show, here's how closeness with a good friend Here's how closest with your with best friends. Here's how you can have you can have queer friends. That that is probably even more possible than getting a boyfriend right away. Is having good queer friends. Um, even though I show a lot of negative queer friendships in this, um, we need that validation too. I think that's that's. Oh, what we, really we need like that to validation say. too. Yeah, we need we need that validation too because a lot of the thesis of a lot of my books are. Not all queer people are good. Don't drop your guard yet. Um, and uh, you'll see that repeat a lot. And in Curse Boys, that's no different. In my mm -hmm. future books, that will be no different. Um, and so I think that I, I, I want to I wanna show all those different things so that people, identity is so important, retain, knowing who you are and being able to retain that and claim your queerness that is where the power is and it's so powerful it must be powerful because that is at the center of all of these attacks there's no other reason there's no other reason to do any of this other than to erase us from daily life which is the big one mm -hmm. the other reason is they just don't want us to know ourselves because again that's exactly. part of it if we don't know ourselves we'll erase ourselves from daily life they don't even need these laws to go forward I've been saying that for a while. You can put a law, you, again, the law doesn't even have to pass. If you expel enough negativity and fear into the ozone or into the water supply, you're like, you're the joker poisoning the water supply of Gotham City. Um, people, queer people, young queer people, especially vulnerable queer people, they'll take, they'll suppress themselves. No one else wants to do anything else. And all you got to do is make everyone afraid. And that's what we're seeing right now. There is, these laws are being very successfully fought everywhere. And yet we are fully seeing these books. Mm -hmm. of that action. My soapbox is done. Thank you. I think it was a market <laughs> soapbox. So I want to end this on... Um, <laughs> A very interesting question that will be very quick and I think on a bit of a lighter note too but um if you could do a dream collab with any author no industry strings attached who would it be and what would the genre lean towards and that was from Jamie thank you Jamie yes um actually my dream collaboration would be with Adam um I'm shocked <laughs> I'm shocked yeah. everyone we should be very shocked I mean, like well, I think it would be, and I just named somebody else. Uh, no, <laughs> no, you I can't. Agree. No, I know. I <laughs> to work with you're the only one who could stand working with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it would be horror. It would definitely be a horror. Um, yeah, so, so never say never. Stay tuned. No, maybe you might get it. We discussed it a little bit. I think again, it's like we. Each of us, between between ourselves, we each have like 10 books. We're like, I'm working on these 10 first. And then <laughs> we're... <laughs> and then maybe then after gotta, that, 10 years down right? the line. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then when the sun burns out. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, I think that, I, I think that's a when, not an if uh, situation. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. And I think it's a matter of, is that YA or is that horror adult? Yeah. That's that's the question we're figuring out right now. 
Because I believe you both have ideas for adult. I will confirm, yes, I do. Yes, yeah. I am I am working on an adult project. I am not leaving YA, but I will say I'm working on an adult thing. Because oh, right all um, over the place. That's the fun thing about being a writer. You can do that. Um mm -hmm. I like that's the other thing is like I'm like I I just want to I just want to go a little I just again I feel like I, Terry you've got the nerve to hit the gas and ride through someone's house in YA I feel like I'm like I gotta get I have to get into a goal <laughs> if I'm gonna hit the gas because <laughs> like I can't I'm too sensitive I'll have I'll I'll someone will send me some DM and I'll just feel like oh my day is ruined like yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Why is listen? Why is and middle and kid lit in general is like it's 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 mm -hmm. tough. It's tough. It's tough yeah. business wise. It is tough. It changes month to month. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Some it, in a job where these books take two years to go from conception to on your on your in your on your bookshelf. It's always changing way too much. By the time the mm -hmm. thing's out, it, like everything's, it's like, it's almost like you got to like time it. And then it's like, oh, you should have known two years ago when you pitched this that um, we'd all be doing blue covers now. Mm -hmm. It's all about the blue cover now. And, uh, and, and we don't do that topic. Anymore. And now we do this. And it's, 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 it's very challenging. Yeah, it's a, it's like I would say it is. I haven't written uh, in other in other age categories, but I would I would very much challenge and warn people who are coming from other age categories who look at why and they go, I could do that. Uh, it would be fine. I would be like, do not approach this age category very lightly. Yeah, honey, I would tell you the younger the target audience the harder it is to write for them. And a lot of people are laboring under the grossly wrong, mis gross misconception that young adult is easier and middle grade is easy, but the younger you get, the harder it gets, I would tell you. And God bless picture book writers, because that is like the hardest of them all. A million times, the only easy like format to write in is a tweet. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's all I'm up and do. Everything else yep. is very, very, very hard. And uh, be very good. <laughs> Tweets we know uh uh literally anyone can do them and everybody does do mm -hmm. them. And uh whether you're yeah. qualified or not or not uh, whether you know what you're talking about or not, uh you can just go tweet. Yeah. That's the fun of social media. <laughs> very fun. <laughs> But on that note, we are almost half an hour late. <laughs> yeah, we were almost we were half having an hour. so much fun. This was so much fun. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Adam and Terry, for being here. This was such a great time. This was this was yeah, really yeah. awesome. And uh, yeah, um, yeah, uh, uh, and and you should have known better having us both on that we would have run off. I, sh I you should just assume at all. Honestly, points. I probably should have. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. We got you got two. <laughs> you got two. Just uh, it's like if you got the two Muppet, uh, uh, uh old men. Just yes, sitting. you're <laughs> right. Not like that. Just... <laughs> you guys are not that old. Not no, but like like we'll just go talk. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like a mix of that we love and telling like, stories <laughs> it's that it's like so it's like if you got like if you mix like a barber with like a like old film historian and it was just like oh the blather oh the blather <laughs> next time we'll make it longer then <laughs> okay, so okay, thanks to everybody for recording i'm gonna end the Coming recording in. right about now so say final farewells Bye. Thank you, everyone, for, Thank you coming. for coming. And I'm very excited. And still excited, even though it's over. This was, such, this was just so much fun. Yeah.